Hello, yeah, my name is Lynn Brecky, Moorhead, Minnesota. You know, they say when you're over 150 miles from home, you're all at once an expert, so I guess that's why they must have called. But anyway, uh, I've far, I've, I'm going to have my 25th year of organic this year, since I switched from conventional. Uh, farm about 2,300 acres, and uh, about a fourth, uh, or excuse me, about 40% of my acres are in alfalfa. Um, the rest is corn and beans, typically. Uh, sometimes there's some small grain in there, and then we also raise some beef cattle, grass-fed organic, and direct market it. Um, first slide here is a picture of alfalfa. And I guess I feel absolutely number one when it comes to weed control is rotation. Yeah, I remember, I think I was only about five years into organic farming, and uh, we started having field days at our place. And there was another farmer that always kept coming uh, to the field days. And uh, he and his brother farmed, I think it was 5,000 acres over in North Dakota, certified organic. And they'd come each year to the field days and they were so concerned about weed control and they wanted to know what we were doing. Finally, they quit farming. They weren't gonna go back to conventional. And they got to a point where they hit the wall and their weed pressure got too great, they just couldn't make it work anymore. So, it's a serious thing. You know, anyone who's done organic knows weed control is a very serious thing, and anyone who's transitioning here or thinking about it, boy, you know, you need, I believe, you need to have a, a zero weed seed tolerance. If you start having weeds going to seed, a little here and a little there, pretty soon it snowballs, and pretty soon you hit the wall. You got a problem. So, there's a whole bunch of ways to do weed control. You know, we saw the crimping is one. Um, just uh, this, this shot here, just showing a guy in a plow, you know, this starts the year before. This starts with your fall tillage. This starts before your fall tillage. Your weed control methods from the previous year are obviously going to impact this year's weed control. Uh, this is a picture of the cultivator. This isn't the very cultivator I use. This one's bigger than mine. I use 18 row and I use 22 inch equipment, 22 inch rows. But I particularly like this cultivator. I've run it for many years. It's an Alloway. It's, uh, it's just bulletproof. But I wanted to show you a few things that I like about it. And I realize whatever cultivator you have, once you figure out the nuances of it, you can make it perform really well. But a few things here is, you can see this is a single shank unit with rolling shields. The shields are locked up right there. But the, the shanks are very, fairly close to the gauge wheels. And also large gauge wheels, so you're getting good even depth control. You know, you'll see some cultivators where the trees are way stretched out, and that can be a problem. Here it shows on this cultivator the adjusting bolt the top one, that's your depth control. But the interesting thing is this one is one where you can control the angle of the sweep. And boy, you can just fine tune that thing wherever you want. You know, if, if you get into a little later season, you don't want to do any root pruning, you can tip that sweep so the tails are just scratching the surface, you're not root pruning. If you want to move some soil, you can, you can uh, do some things with that as well. I don't know if you folks are familiar with double disc cutaways. Uh, don't use them a lot, but sometimes you get in that field where you got some weeds, you got some grass, and double disc cutaways can do an amazing thing. It's like they just reach into that row band and, and pull that material out. It's amazing how you can reduce your uh, weed population with that system. But your cultivator has to be tight because there's side draft with that. And it'll, take, it'll love to take the rows out just, just as well as it'll take the weeds. So it's got to be tight. Um, this is just a photo of something that's available on the market. But I do use, I, I made something like this on my cultivator. It's, uh, it's something I use in the wheel tracks because sometimes you get slabbing. Slabs want to go onto the rows. Uh, it's just a nice way to prevent that. I also run a camera. And uh, 
I like the camera because sometimes when you're looking down at your row, um, you get one view, you think you're on the row. You get out and walk and look behind, you realize you weren't really quite on the row, as on the row as you thought. And you get another perspective. You can put that camera right down on the row and watch that row go through the cultivator. So it gives you a little more perspective. Uh, we use RTK. We've used RTK for 15 years uh, for cultivating. And um, I also use a steerable quick tatch. So if sometimes even with RTK, your tractor might be right on, but maybe your cultivator, uh, maybe there's something funky in the hitch, or maybe uh, you're on a little side slope or something, and you can just dial that half inch or that inch, you know, that you need to bump over. So I really like using that. Here's a, a picture of a tine weeder. Tine weeder is my favorite weed control device. Now granted, if you've got a lot of residue, that's not going to work real swell. It's going to plug. But in a lot of cases uh, where you don't, have, uh, you don't have a lot of residue, you'll do, in my view, in our soils, you do a much more thorough job of weed control than you'll do with a rotary hole. Granted, it's not nearly as fast, but I really like it. For the most part, I find your depth control for a tine weeder is how firm the soil is when you plant. So we're always thinking about that when we're making our seed bed, if we have to do a little firming or something so that we're sure that that tine weeder is going to run above where our kernels are. Because if, especially in soybeans, and you folks probably know this, if you move that kernel one bit once it's started to swell, it won't grow. So you want to make sure that that tine weeder is operating above the seed. We usually plant it about an inch and a quarter. Tine weeder usually runs about an inch. So. And here's a picture of a rotary hoe, um, just showing the fact that uh, it's much more tolerant to the residue. And uh, I always feel both with the, uh, the tine weeder and the rotary hoe and the cultivator you need to have more and bigger equipment than you should need to have. You know, and I'm up at uh, Moorhead, the weather station up there says that in June, we have 17 rain days in June. That's the days when it's actually raining. Now there's other days when it's too wet. So that leaves you about not very many days to get this work done. And there are times when it's just getting barely dry enough to sneak out with a rotary hole and it's going to rain again tonight. You've got to get across the whole farm today and you may want to rotary hole it twice. So you've got to have enough iron and labor to make sure you can get that work done on time or you're going to have a forest. Here's a lightning weeder. Um, we have two of these. Uh, they were built back in the 80s. They don't make them anymore. They were used in sugar beets. Once the uh, herbicides got better in the sugar beets, they, they went out of business. It's a tool that, like, like several tools, and I'll show you another one, that can, uh, it has its place, but you don't want to use it every year because you just don't always get that right situation for it. Works well when you have scattered weeds, um, not heavy population of weeds, and the weeds have to be taller than the crop. It's got a 60 kW generator that's PTO driven. It energizes that bar that you hold right above the growing crop, and then when it contacts the weed, it grounds out, electrocutes the weed, the weed's dead immediately. And it also works well on certain species, but it doesn't work great on all species, so it depends what you're, what you're dealing with. So, But I, I wouldn't race right out there and think that this is the silver bullet, because it's not. I find that one year I'll use it a lot, and then I'll sit in the shed for five years. So, there was a question? Uh, is there a type of weed works better on? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, works well on pigweed, lamb's quarter, Canada thistle, um, anything else is pretty marginal, doesn't work on grasses. 
Um, yeah, that's about it. One thing I haven't talked about, and I, I, I'll do that now, is kind of how we do, and I've got a few more machines to go through here, but how we do our weed control. And I've done this ever since I started. And it's, I didn't know another organic farmer when I transitioned. I, was, I, I figured it out on my own what made sense, and we've kind of just stuck with it. When I plant soybeans, as an example, Usually three days after planting, I'll go out with the harrow and I'll harrow. And I'll harrow every five to seven days after that until I see my first blossom. And it's amazing. It's amazing the job it'll do. It's amazing how well the beans tolerate it. Um, I get very, very little stand loss uh, with the harrowing. Sometimes I've got a substitute and use a rotary hole don't get quite the control, but nothing's perfect. So I typically plant on soybeans a minimum of 200,000. Um, yeah, so we do some flame cultivating. This is a flamer. This is a 54 row that we, uh, we ran for several years. And uh, we use this one just for pre-emerge flaming, like in, when the corn is just going to spike. If you've got some weeds in the band, you can clean up that band. A lot of times it's too wet to get out and, and do a harrowing or, or a rotary hoeing, but you can get out and flame. Um, There's another one we run. Uh, we've got several different flamers that are set up different ways. This one is a typical. It has the two burners that you'd use in corn. Here we're uh, flaming cotyledon soybeans. Um, works well to flame cotyledon soybeans. I get real careful once you see a true leaf. I rarely will flame beans that are not cotyledon. Here's a weed puller. This is not ours. This is just a picture I grabbed. Um, I feel like that's a lot like the lightning weeder. It works really well when you get that right situation but you don't often get that right situation. Um, it'll work well on pigweed and lamb's quarter. It's got to be something that's going to stick up above the crop, and your soil conditions have to be soft enough so it'll pull it out of the ground without just snapping it off. Some of you have probably seen this. USDA is working on this sandblasting device where they're you can use kind of a, a variety of uh, mediums, grits, to put through there might be ground corn cobs, could be gypsum so, uh, fertilizers. And they've had amazing results in their testing. I, I want to say like up to 60 or 80 percent on grass control in corn, very uh, better control on broadleaves. And I'm not sure where this project's at right now, but that's one I kind of keep an eye on. This is a device that's uh, they're running these in Europe. Um, it's a single row, totally robotic weeder. And uh, so it operates on its own through the soil. It mechanically goes down and takes out whatever weeds it sees. It, it, it can see the weed uh, from the crop and differentiate it. The price, I forget, it's some atrocious price. It was over a million dollars. Okay, that sounds pretty crazy, but when you figure that thing can run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and when you get done with it, it can go to South America and it can run all winter too, maybe it's got a place. And we all know the, the price is going to come down on some of this stuff, but gives you an idea of what's coming. And you know, when we've done everything we can do, then that's what we do. And we do run, uh, we do walk all our beans, bean fields. Uh, corn, we're really relying on maybe tine weeding, rotary hoeing, row cultivating, flaming. Uh, that's kind of our program. We do small grains as well sometimes. Um, so, I guess questions or just open? Well, yeah. Okay. Sure. There you go. I don't have a computer. Okay. 
do you want this here? Uh, I think this yeah, is I the video. The, there you go. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> This on, this on, or? Okay, no? Uh, there we go. Okay, I guess it's working now. Um, I know everyone loves to look at the machinery and the hardware, but I want to uh, try to exercise the most important piece of hardware everyone's got, and that's what you know. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> And I, I do this in a lot of meetings, and I'd uh, like to have you think about a weedy field somewhere on your farm or somebody else's. It's always more fun to think about it if it's on the neighbor's farm. And what will happen if you totally abandon it next year? What's, what are you going to see, and which weeds are going to be there, and how many? I'm sure you're all thinking of the answer. Now think about if you went two years. And some of these weeds, like pigweed, uh, some of the summer grasses, can make hundreds of thousands of seeds, or even millions on one plant. So do you think if the field is overrun with a species or a group of species this year, that you're going to see a thousand times more of the same thing next year? No. Well, why not? Uh, weeds are changing the soil. That's right. And, but to our, the way we've been taught to think, especially those of us who started out as conventional farmers, the weeds are all accidental things that we have to react to. So you already know, if you abandon that field, that the weeds are not going to come back the same way. What would happen if you went 10 years? And that's going to depend on whether you're in a prairie farm area or what had been originally forest. Uh, where we are, you're going to start seeing goldenrod, and then you start seeing brambles, and then you start seeing sumac and other woody plants. And if you waited 500 years, you'd be to hard oak, hardwood oak forest, at least on our farm. Some parts of this area, I'm sure you would end up in probably tall grass prairie. Uh, Dr. Albrecht wrote about that way back 70, 80 years ago, and he called that state that the land is going to go to the climax crop. That's a stable situation. Everything we do in our fields is an unstable situation. It's a succession. What's happening is each group of plants changes the soil. And next year, the group of plants that's best adapted to that, those conditions are going to dominate that field. Now, keep that in mind when we think about weed control. The conditions that we create in the field, you know, and it's, you can walk away and just let it happen, or we can do things that impact it, are going to set the stage for what is the best adapted species for that particular field. And I was very heavily influenced the first years we were organic, studying a German weed scientist. His name was Bernard Rademacher. And he made, a, made some really brilliant observations. He was the guru of weeds in Europe. He was the first guy to use herbicides. And he was also the harshest critic of herbicides. And I think he was one of these guys that really could see what he was looking at. His theory was that every plant should be, every crop should be grown after its most suitable predecessor. So that the increased vigor of that crop alone will help that crop outcompete the weeds. Or another way of putting it is if we're, if the crop that we're trying to grow is the best adapted species for the environment that's in that field, it's going to have a biological advantage over all the other plants. Now, wouldn't cultivating be a lot more fun if we could set up 
if we actually knew enough that we could make sure that our crop was the best adapted species in our field. And every once in a while this happens by accident. It happened to me, probably still only happens by accident to me. But when it does happen, uh, the crop really doesn't have a whole lot of issues. You don't have weeds, you don't have pests bother, you just don't have a whole lot of other things go wrong. Now can one other piece to think about is can we point at systems that take advantage of that? And I think uh, there was a book, probably another one that goes back 70, 80 years, Farmers for 40 Centuries. And what that, the author of that book did was went around the world at the time and looked at stable farming systems. Now I don't think we could call our modern American agriculture a stable system. It's been around for, what, 40, 50, 60 years? but every couple of years we have to tweak it somehow to keep it working, and I'm, I'm talking about conventional agriculture. But he looked at systems that had been more or less stable for hundreds or thousands of years and that were still working. And the, the one that sticks in my mind was the far eastern rice culture, and there were different rotations, but each of them had a complex group of plants that was grown or crops that were grown in a certain order that it was done in, and certain practices that had been passed down. And they seemed to maintain the fertility, they seemed to maintain high yields and controlled pests. And it was because the, they were creating an environment in those farming systems that always favored their crop. Now they still had to do some work, they still had to weed, but it made a big difference. So I just wanted to keep that as a lens to think about our weed control. And Dr. Rademacher used a term in his book that he called cultural weed control. Now, cultural weed control is basically trying to create this set of conditions where our crop has the advantage. What we were doing on our farm when we were farming conventionally is what I would call cultural weed enhancement. And that's why we constantly had to find new herbicides because every time some random new weed came up that was immune to our herbicides, we had to come up with something stronger and it was always more expensive than the last thing we did. And um, I was kind of in that mindset. It was always, oh, this darn new pest. And always had to figure out what was the best way to react to it. And I, I just wasn't realizing what we were doing. So what were we doing? We were farming we were using the same practices year in and year out. We were growing the same set of crops. And each year, there would be a few weeds that escaped or a few pests that escaped what we were doing. And they would go to seed. And all of those seeds would fall on the ground. Next year, we gave them the, exactly the same environment. And they were even more successful, and they crossed with each other. And then the third year, they had the same environment again, only now we know how, how many seeds they can make. You can get a 1,000 or 100,000 times as many as you had the year before. It doesn't take too long before you have a resistant weed and you need a new herbicide. That was cultural weed enhancement. So what are the practices? And this was, this was where Dr. Rademacher's work really made me turn around. He was talking about which practices can you use on your farm that will favor the crop over the weeds. And obviously it depends on which species you're growing. Uh, one, and I, I, in the interest of time, I want to pick out a few that are kind of common sense and easy for everyone to take home and use. But to me, the most successful one is to not grow a crop year after year that has the same life cycle. If we always plant, <coughs> if we always plant spring seeded crops that are planted at the same time, grow through the same season, and are harvested at the same time, we're going to select for a group of pests that have that life cycle. So you know what they are. We all have them on our farms. But how serious a problem would horseweed be if we were planting winter grains? I don't think it would be able to complete its life cycle because the crop would be mismatching the weed and we would be wearing out the weed seed bank 
because we, wouldn't, we would be denying the crop the, uh, the conditions it needed to complete its life cycle. Now, if we went to winter grains every year, we'd be selecting for a different group of weeds that followed that life cycle. So let's take that a step further and think about how do we create a cropping system where every year the conditions are a little different so that we don't select for which weeds are going to fit here. Every year the weeds that made seed are going to find, oh, we're not where we want to grow. Just by using timing, we can really deal and start dealing with some of these problems that seem to be so hard to uh, get on top of. Now, I'm going to give you an example from Cornell. I've been, we've been part of a project there that's their long-term systems trial. And I like to put a plug in. Uh, universities tend to get funding for short-term work, but it's awfully hard to get funding anywhere for long-term trials. And that's really what we need. You have to do something long enough. If you're going to study a system, you have to do it long enough so that it becomes a stable system, so that you have a set of conditions that you can count on. In the Cornell trial, originally, they set it up to mimic what was working out on farms. And at that time, our standard rotation in New York was very similar to yours here. Uh, we had an advantage because we can grow winter grains more easily. So that rotation was a three-year cycle. It was corn followed by soybeans, followed by winter wheat or spelt, which was underseeded to clover. The clover made enough nitrogen to grow corn. We'd go back to corn. That worked really well for about six, maybe nine, eight, ten years. And then we started seeing perennial weeds. And every year the perennial weeds got worse, especially in some of the trials, some of the treatments where we were using higher fertility and less tillage. We started seeing Canada thistle, uh, south thistle, this whole group of perennial weeds, and they were really serious. They had gotten to the point where they were starting to really pull the yields down. And they called a meeting of the farmer advisors. And one of the things that made this systems trial really valuable was that it reflected what was happening out on the farms. When a decision had to be made, they actually brought in a group of organic farmers, and they said, now, what would, what would a real farmer do in this situation? And they, they really were faithful about staying, keeping the university doing something that reflected real life. And we were kind of at an impasse. Some of these plots were absolutely fouled. What didn't help any was that the manager of the Cornell Organic Farm when they told him, or of the Cornell uh, Research Farm, when they told him that he was going to have an organic plot, he took this wet spot where the tiles were broken and where he couldn't grow crops and it was followed with perennials to start with, and he made that the organic systems trial experiment. So we had some, we had some legacy problems coming in. Uh, he was quite chagrined when a couple of years during that trial, he was, we were getting 20 bushel more from the organic than he was from his GMO fields on, on the better ground. Uh, that didn't happen every year. Of course, whenever the GMO corn yielded higher, it was because GMOs yield higher. And whenever the organic ones did better, it's because of the weather. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that, that was another story. But what we did there uh, at that meeting was I made a suggestion that was immediately shot down by our experts. And I, what I suggested was let's, take, let's try to throw in one more crop that mismatches the life cycle of the Canada thistle. And we took winter barley. So we followed the winter spelt, which had clover in it, with winter barley. Winter barley in New York is harvested before the Canada thistle blooms and sets seed. And then we double crop that with buckwheat so that we disturb the field right in midsummer. Now, there, there is some method to this madness. One is that this Canada thistle has a tremendous deep root system that stores energy, and it can, you know, you can mow it off, you can do a lot of things to it, but if it's got that reserve, it can come back. A friend of ours, uh, actually it was his great uncle, had done research in Germany on Canada thistle, and they discovered that the Canada thistle has a fungal organism that lives on its roots that it needs for survival and to be healthy, that this organism needed to be in an oxygen-free zone. We tended to see the thistle be in these compacted areas. 
It was always worse than the low spots and the wet spots. And that, that kind of fit. So by cutting this uh, with the barley and then deep tilling it and planting buckwheat, we were disturbing the roots just as they wanted to reproduce. And when we got, got all done laying out what we were going to do, our uh, resident weed expert said, you will never do enough damage to the reserves that root system has in one cycle to make any difference. Uh, two years later, when we got our reports and looked at the data, the uh, guy who managed the plots announced, well, we can go back to our old rotation now. We don't have the perennials anymore. Which the uh, first question should have been, why would we want to go back to the rotation that created that situation? <laughs> but what, what happened there? We changed that environment by deep tilling in the summer, by cutting the thistle at that critical stage. Uh, we allowed the thistle to change the soil, but we also changed what we were doing and we took away the conditions that were setting us up for that particular pest to thrive. So I just thought I'd throw that out as kind of a lens to look through. And every one of us, when we look at our fields, look at the weeds, we can see something that we have to kill, or maybe we can see something that we ought to study. Every one of these weeds, and I, I really think the, the horseweed is an interesting one. And there's a group in Iowa, Practical Farmers is supporting, is having some calls and meetings where they're, they're discussing how, 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 do we get, how do we understand this pest and how do we change our management to get rid of it. And I, I really think this is going to be the long-term uh, way to deal with all of these crop pests. And it's a way that organic farmers can work together. Because everybody has, everybody's better at something than someone else is. And when you have a group of farmers, you've got a lot more ideas, you can try a lot more things, and then come back and share what we learned. And that's a lot of how organic farming has advanced in New York. We have a group that Mary Hall and I helped start many, many years ago called New York Certified Organic. We'll meet three to, three to four times a year in the winter. And we tend to have round tables where farmers will say, I've got a problem with such and such, and bring it up. And then the entire group will discuss. We have also have programs like this. But the entire group then will discuss the problem. And it's amazing how many problems have been solved, markets have been developed, other things have happened just because there's a group of farmers uh, who cooperate. So uh, now I'm going to make a radical shift over to equipment. I love equipment too, and iron is a lot of fun. And Mary Hall showed you some pictures earlier of some of the things our son Peter has done. There is a technology in Europe that's rapidly being developed and you just heard, saw some pictures of it uh, just a few minutes ago. And that's camera technology. And we have a, a friend there who actually has some patents on some of this weed control technology. They have discovered uh, with, with cameras, you don't have to identify the weed, per se. You don't have to be able to tell the crop from the weed. That's, they were barking up the wrong tree when they first started this. There's something about our crop that's so different from the weeds that it's very easy for a machine to tell. And that's the crop grows and grows. And the way this technology works is it looks down the field for geometric patterns. So there's a camera that mounts on the toolbar of your cultivator. And that camera is looking for parallel lines that are the right distance apart. The early versions of this were made in England by a company called Garford. And there was a side shifting hitch that would adjust. And what this camera looked for was contrast at um, whatever row spacing you set it for. And it would look for four rows. So you could have two rows missing. And it would still be locked on to these parallel rows. The accuracy on the early ones was about one centimeter. And the other surprising thing about this technology is that if it's having trouble finding the roll, you can make it more accurate by going faster. And there are uh, some pictures on the internet of these machines that are uh, literally going down the row, holding it down, holding the 
tolerance down to about less than an inch. You know, a centimeter is less than half an inch. And moving at a fairly high clip and successfully taking out just about all the weeds. And our, our friend who I'm referring to has developed another machine called a finger weed. Those are plastic stars and they're different diameters. And then in a smaller diameter, there are steel spikes that stick into the soil. So that as it goes forward, the steel spike will make the star turn. You have two of those and the fingers are spinning. They literally will pluck the weeds out of the row. And it's, you have to see something like this to believe it actually works. They tested it in California in some of the vegetables and they were showing that it was 99 plus percent effective. But the catch is you have to hold that machine dead on the row or it won't work. And you have to loosen the soil ahead of it or it can't pluck the weeds out. If you look on the internet, uh, there's a company called Einbuck that sells these machines. Uh, you can search on Garford. And we invested an obscene amount of money in one of these early prototypes. As our, partly because Peter wanted it and partly because I like toys. And we just found out last year that, this, that Garford is no longer the leader. But there's another company in Europe which uh, the company's called Klaus, actually, that uh, developed uh, guidance technology that was originally for holding a combine on the road, for guiding a combine. And they have gone to two cameras. One that uses a little different wavelength than the other, so that they have a more accurate contrast for finding roads. And uh, at this point, there are, I think, three different companies that license this technology, and they will sell you a cultivator that will work to very effectively uh, to, guide the, to guide the cultivator at that really tight tolerance at a relatively high speed. Uh, that seems like that's pretty high tech, but then uh, my friend, his name is Christian, Christian Kirko. He was looking at a technology that would look down on the row. So now after he's got this very tight adjusting on the cultivator going forward uh, for something like tomatoes or beets or, well, sugar beets anyway, things that are further apart, cabbage, he came up with a set of uh, fingers in a solenoid that will snap together as you're going down the row and whenever it comes up on a plant, it snaps apart like a set of doors that opens when you walk through it, gets just past the plant and snaps shut again and will actually take the weeds out between the row, between the plants in the row. And he has some of these uh, mounted on YouTube where the guy, the, the guy actually got out of it because they figured out how to use the CAN bus on the tractor to, to steer it. He said, of course, this is illegal. And he got out of the tractor and walked behind it as it was driving itself across the field, holding the cultivator dead on the row and taking out the weeds between the plants at the same time. Now, you can imagine what a mess that would be if it's malfunctioning. But. <laughs> But that, that really is the direction the technology is going in. And I'm going to close with the even more outrageous, and that the, your pictures of those autonomous robots. There is one that was at the Paris show two years ago that used the double camera for contrast, used GPS to find roughly where the roll was, used the double camera for contrast, and then used imaging to specifically tell the difference between the crop and the weed. And this thing would take three rows and weave them uh, robotically, and it costs $60,000. But I'm sure they're going to have some boats to work out of that. But that's how fast technology moves ahead. But I think even the best technology is going to fail if we don't use the cultural practice.
not easy acts to follow. So I just wanted to give him a special thank you. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll let him get started here. And then after uh, Jonathan's done, we'll bring all three back up and we can um, put him in the hot seat and ask him questions. All right. Thank you. Um, so, not quite 2,000 acres, about 1,100 acres. Um, we have been farming um, organically since 98 when I started transitioning before that. I never thought it was possible. Um, so, following these guys, especially, it's like, wow, they've got a lot more experience, a lot more knowledge, and I, I've learned a lot from them. Uh, I'll just tell you a little about our operation. Um, strictly, primarily corn, soybeans, and, and wheat. Um, we've been doing that for a number of years. Um, I, I agree with Lynn that you know, zero weeds is always the goal. I think um, letting any weeds go. So it's always been my objective to have clean, good fields, and we know that uh, tends to uh, help yields and we in the future. Um, so, um, prim, when I plant the weeds early and thick, um, we've had good success at weed control. Um, and then I will send out a crew uh, that comes up to help me walk beans um, just to hit thistle patches. And we'll uh, cut them off. And then after harvest, um, I do uh, a deep tillage through that field. Um, right after I spit some hard manure on that field. Um, after the, the deep tillage, I'm planting a cover crop. We're putting tillage radish and oats on. And I have been putting the tillage radish in, in my row crop planter, putting four pounds an acre on and planting it exactly where the corn plant is going to be next to. You can do this with GPS technology when you get your line set and uh, the idea is that this, this root is putting a big taproot in and pulling nutrients into the zone right where your corn plant is going to be growing the next year. Um, I do feel cultivate that in the spring. We're pretty shallow feel cultivating and getting it all ready um, and then planting the, the corn onto those exact lines which are, are pre-established. Um, I've had, I really like that. I pulled up some tillage radish this year I had a plan before Labor Day. You know, the idea of getting a cover crop started, the, the trick is getting a nice rain off of it. You know, you can't, you can't plan on that. In some falls, we just don't get August rains or September rains. And it's really tough to establish it. One year, I had this great stand of cover crop in the spring. It was all there, but it didn't come up during the spring. And then we dug it up uh, before we planted it. But that was good, good for the soil, too, I believe. Uh, but I, it's until the dry issues that I pull out the 14 inches. I mean, and they're, they're still growing because, uh, you know, I think it takes almost 20 degrees before they actually die and won't come back. Um, and then in the spring, they just basically disappear and leave a hole in the ground. Um, they get to be, sometimes when it gets to be taller, it gets to be quite a, a mat to, to deal with. This, this spring was one of those springs last fall was you know, it was almost knee high, and the oats were actually heading out, which wasn't my plan, but uh, they, they got tall, and um, we actually just it up a little bit, and, and then seeded into a nice thing. So after uh, we get the corn planted, we wait till mid-May to plant it. You know, we wait waiting till um, that seed is going to pop right out. Uh, my plan is I always drag that field three days after I can if we haven't had the rain. I, I like the dragon harrow early. It's such an effective tool. I, I do that to, to make sure and start over that there's nothing coming. Um, I'm a firm believer in the road to Once that seed is out of the ground or up, um, then I'll come back at least two um, times with the road to to help clean it up. And I know that it works because uh, you can see that little strip on the edge of the field that doesn't get ready to go. It always turns green. Um, it's working. Um, I, <laughs> talking with you here in class um, at the Moses conference a couple of times, we actually got exactly what we spent, you know, 10 minutes talking about. Uh, and I thought, well, there goes my speech. 
Uh, we got um, the top prize uh, finger reader goes into the rows and then the camera mounts it. Um, previous to that, I've been using the uh, cutaway discs. Um, and the problem with the cutaway discs, and I have like the old technology of a navigator that fills the rows, um, the corner plants are too small and you want it to be in there right away to use that. And so with this camera technology, it actually, it, it sees that row and it can be very small and it can be in there. It's, it has to be big enough so you're not covering it up yet though. So uh, we're actually gonna try it this year after we've already go of going in there uh, without a cultivator on it and, and uh, just using the finger reader to get right into that row. Cultivating in between the row is easy because you can get aggressive later, but in between the row is really hard. Uh, and, and primarily our, our goal is to make sure we get all the grass controlled. Um, we come back um, with the flame reader then. Uh, it seems like we have lots of different tools, but it's just the way I, I'm using them on my farm. On the corn plants, uh, we come with the flame reader running in each row. Um, and, and have had very effective food control on our corn. Um, and then come back with a cultivator, a different cultivator again for the taller crops. Um, I, I, I love the camera technology. Um, seems like but once the corn got tall enough, uh, the wind would blow this way or stop blowing for a second in gusts of wind, and, and the camera was uh, trying to figure out where it is sometimes. And so the finger actually healers in the taller crops work pretty well and then to actually switch to that instead of the camera. Um, then uh, pretty much weed control for the corn, we will take care of. Um, and then the next crop rotation we go into the soybeans. I, I do use more more board plow and the corn primarily because I'm trying to get uh, enough residue gone so that I can uh, drag and arrow the soybeans right after they are planted. Um, I, um, it is interesting because a lot of neighbors a couple years ago we had a real dry winter, a lot of wind, and my plow ground wasn't blowing. It, it was the neighbors' fields that, that had chiseled out or whatever they did, and it's just like, that's because we have soil health and soil health and it holds it together. It's like, it's interesting that even my black soils um, were blowing. Um, I think it's, it's because we're doing the organic thing and, and the cover crops and the extra locations. But uh, we do the same things in the beans. The camera works fantastic on beans. You can go to a spot that has gotten green. It, it knows exactly where the, those rows are and it shifts your cultivator over. We're, We've been using R RTK technology to steer the tractor, but then again, if you're, if, it's perfect if you're planting on a tar road, maybe. But you know, a field has bumps and hills and, and things like that. So you, your tractor and camera and the planter is moving, so when you cultivate it, if you, if you didn't find an exact straight line. So this is actually getting your cultivator right into those rows and really close, and the finger way to work pretty well. Uh, we're following that. After a couple of rotary bubble passes and a couple cultivation passes, or at least one cultivation pass, we, we do have a few walkers that come up and help us. We've had a family that's come up from Texas for a number of years and works for us and, and cleans up the park our broadly. So our goal is to make sure that field is clean um, and, and looks decent and getting all those reeds. And sometimes that expense gets a little higher than we want, but um, I'm fascinated with the I, I tried rolling rye before. My, I only put two bushel an acre or less than two bushel an acre on, and I planted it late. I tried it for two years and it, I, I was unsuccessful with it. Now I listen to this, but maybe I should be trying that again. Uh, three bushels an acre and, and planting it sooner. So there's things to keep learning and keep trying, but this is, this is what we've done in our farm. So. Um, Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so now I'll invite uh, Klaus and Lynn and uh, John to take a seat on the, on the hot seat table here and uh, we'll open up the floor to questions.
um, just like you did with the previous session. soybeans uh, this year we did at uh, one field of alfalfa you know I, I know all the benefits of alfalfa and I I think if I can rotate more of that in uh, not having cows or never being raised on cows I, I I miss that in my operation I think that's a valuable thing you can do working with a, a dairy farmer next to me on, on this farm so we'll open it up for questions I guess I'll just make a little comment while we're waiting here. Back when I first started, there was a fellow that I ran across in the Twin Cities, and I think he was an inspector, and I was just getting started, and you know, he was he was old, a lot of gray hair, and he said, you know you're gonna need a sod crop, because I was raising beans and wheat, and that was about it, really, at that point. And I thought, yeah, right, I'm never doing and uh, so then it was beans and then wheat and then maybe a little, and then I started doing corn too and it was kind of beans and corn and I could just see that there was a train wreck on the horizon and he was absolutely right and we started putting alfalfa in there and I did not want to, alfalfa is a ton of work, but it's what made it all work. Do you sell your alfalfa crop or feed it? Ours goes all through Organic Valley, and yes, it's all sold. Um, we, our cattle are on pasture, and then sometimes if there's some real subpar hay, like bottom bales, we might feed them. You know? so. I had uh, three fields of soybeans this year, and we pressured all three. The one was so bad I decided to work it up. I wasn't gonna let it go to seed. <coughs> And the young fellow rented it and planted it to um, sorghum. But there were a couple older guys who told me that they thought sorghum or sedan grass actually could have an effect of suppressing the weeds for the future. Did you speak to that? Yeah, the sedan sorghum and sorghum uh, have a strong allele pack. And I would uh, mention that's one of the cultural controls that I could have mentioned. Uh, I think what we need is research from universities on the plants that have allelopathy, and each allelopathy has its own control spectrum, just like chemicals would. So, for instance, if you've been growing rye, I, I know the question was discussed earlier, uh, if you try to plant soybeans or sunflowers afterwards, it'll fail because the allelopathy from rye, even a year, even a half a year later, will kill sunflowers outright. Uh, we've got neighbors who learned the hard way you don't plant melons after rye because it'll kill them. So that for each 
crop that has a little happy, it'll have some other crops that it may help. There'll be some that it might be neutral on, there'll be some that it hurts, and some that it absolutely kills. And then that's a piece of work that we need to learn more about. And I, I just like to say, you know, and I get up and talk, and then I go sit down, and I always think of what I didn't say, you know. And I, I really can't stress enough. You know, I was talking about all these tools to go out and kill weeds, but it is all about rotation. Yeah. Yep. Question for uh, Lynn and Johnson. Uh, Lynn, you mentioned that sometimes you do a second year of corn and soybeans first year. Uh, and Johnson, do you follow the week? Or I guess my question to the two of you is where did the nitrogen come from? I'm using uh, poultry manure, having that trucked in. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm using hog manure. I have a, a confinement finish barn I've had for a while, and then I'm buying some hog manure from neighbors. Um, previous to the, uh, after the soybeans, um, I'll put a, a small amount on for the wheat crop, and then um, I, I do it after the wheat crop or small grain crop um, for next year's. And we're putting it on in August um, or very early September and then putting the cover crop on. I think the oats that's growing, you know, captures any nitrogen that might want to be leaching. Um, we, we're we getting yields very similar to our neighbors. It, it's interesting that my wife was just at a conference that they had a Monsanto guy stock and he said, we've built up con conventional farmers income by 68%. And I was like, that's just strange because my yields are similar and I'm not using any GMOs. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so we're using extra nutrients. Thank you. Go ahead. With the uh, that continual use of whether hog or poultry manure, do you ever run into high phosphate levels hindering your yields? We have not gotten to that point. We uh, we have a lot of alfalfa in our rotation. Uh, about 900 acres of alfalfa every year, and, and alfalfa uses so much phosphorus that so we're just not running into that. You know, just, I also want to comment too, yeah, we use the manure, but that is not our sole source of fertility. You know, I'm on the Albrecht system, and we're, uh, we're addressing NPK, S, uh, uh, calcium, zinc, boron, copper, manganese, cobalt, so it's, it's the whole spectrum. Yes, I think it's worth uh, commenting on nitrogen fixation and the ability of legumes to fix. Uh, I, I went to college long enough ago that I remember the textbook said clover can make 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen and alfalfa might be able to make 100. If you do the calculations, a 10 ton crop of alfalfa contains over 800 pounds of nitrogen. So if alfalfa can fix 100 pounds, where are the 800 pounds that we removed in addition to what's leaving, what the roots are leaving coming from? Uh, clover, I've documented that the tops that came off the total 450 to 500 pounds of nitrogen. It's just that if the soil has a, a low, a lot of carbon and a low amount of nitrogen, a legume can produce a huge amount. And I remember learning from my old ed teacher, he would say, uh, legumes are like people, they only work as hard as they have to. And one of the Cornell trials that we hosted, was looking at the ability of legumes to fix nitrogen in different systems. And there seemed to be a feedback loop that if you had a very high nitrogen level in your soil, the legumes acted like grasses. But if you had a very low nitrogen level in the soil, they, they would really fix a lot. And in crops where you're removing a lot of nitrogen, uh, they would, it would stimulate them to fix even more. And this is an observation I wanted to share on the no-till soybeans in the rolled rye. That rye grows is taking a massive amount of nitrogen out of the system, putting a lot of carbon back. And I think it's stressing the soybeans and forcing them to fix more nitrogen. And that, when you think about these yields, when you go above 60 to 70 bushels of soybeans, that's enough, that's more nitrogen than on paper a soybean ought to be able to fix. But I, I do think that the, the rye may have, it may have an interplay there. So one, one or go ahead. Um, I've, is, 
it's interesting that I, I've, I've just applied the manure or figured out the nutrients for my crops and I, I've done it as a broadcast level, as a field level, and, and I'll continue to soil test. But recently I've been doing grid sampling and it's like, well, how does that, how can you, because you can only put so much nitrogen down um, in front of a corn crop from your hog manure. Um, but I'm finding out uh, by gridding, I have a precision planter and we can do variable rates. And so I'm actually, and I have a, a, my planter set, so it's not gonna go so low, but I think I can get a healthier, bigger plant uh, on the sandier soils um, by planting, you know, 28,000. And then in the heavier ground, um, in the good soils, you know, I'll go up to 38,000. And so I, I think we can put a taller plant on, a bigger plant that's going to, you know, um, be more beneficial and put a, a full cob on. Um, then the other thing by grid sampling, and, and I'm, I'm gonna see if, if, uh, if this turns around and bites me because I don't know the answer to yet, but I, I, I know that some of my soils are very low on phosphorus and some places are good. Um, there's not a lot of extra phosphorus in hog manure anymore, just with the diets that most people are feeding. But um, we're act I actually went in and I, I took a, s a spin spreader and, and took um, chicken litter pellets and went into the lowest testing phosphorus soils to spread in front of my bean crop. Because beans need a certain amount of phosphorus. Um, although with that, I'm getting some nitrogen. So now I'm, I'm excited, but a little nervous that you know the extra nitrogen could be uh, extra weed. So we'll see how it all works out. But I'm I'm excited to be able to do that to my lowest testing soils. matters. What we were doing is right after small crane, um, and that's our plan to continue. Um, that's when we did our grid sampling was the question. Um, I think, you know, a grid sampling, they don't recommend you do every two or three. I think it's more like a five-year cycle. I'm, I'm excited to see the changes over time. And, and uh, a farm, I farmed conventionally in the 80s. Uh, when, Yes, I'm barely that old. Um, we, we actually had grid sampled, and I'm, at, I'm looking for those results to compare with what we're doing now. And so I'm, I'm excited to see that. Again. Another comment on nitrogen, and it may be more important in the 
piece, so it's definitely important where it was human. And that's the, the presence of enough nitrogen for the crop is only half of the equation. The rest is it mineralizes and becomes available in time when the crop needs it. And we quite often have issues, in, at least in New York, either with a severe drought or with excess cold rain in the spring, that if the nitrogen mineralizes after the crop needed it, it's there, but it's sort of like the, the help coming after the house burned down. It only makes the weeds grow. So it, what's really important with nitrogen management is not just to have enough pounds or putting on more pounds is better, but to get those pounds to be biologically available at, in sync with when the crop needs them. Ilya asked uh, the best, uh, and, and my, I'm planting the corn after the brassicas of the, the radish, and you know, we, we go out there, the field is dug, and we want to make sure, okay, are we on, on top of the line? It's, it's amazing. When we planted that, those radishes in rows, you poke your hand down, and, and you can feel all of a sudden, your hand just kind of disappears, and it's just like, there's no thing here. It's just soil, and it's just like a garden. It's just amazing. Another question. Mine's a two-part question. I told you about those bad bean fields. So I had one, I did one to plow on there, work up, so I took a three-point hitch mower, raised it as high as I could above the beans, and I mowed. I didn't have access to it other than myself. I didn't have anyone to pull away to cover. And I did that twice until it got so high, you know, the field that so our takeoff would be a problem. And it did help, but I was told by a fellow that he thought there's a point where if you cut them off, they're too young, they actually, there are more sprouts on those. And he said, Jim, if you did it at the wrong time, you're going to have double yeah. there. Now, I must have done it late enough and then okay, but you can speak to that. And the last one is, could you share anything about your feelings or attitudes about moldboard plowing and chisel plowing, pros and cons, times and things? Um, and, and we always have hindsight, and as a farmer, it's like, mm, what could I have done better this year? And, and we always struggle with things that didn't go quite right. Um, the bottom line is, I think mowing it off the tops or electrocuting it, or uh, the, the weed puller. My friend was so excited that he, he got this weed puller, and it's like, if the weeds have gotten that big, you're too late. <laughs> you know, we, we, you gotta, you got to be aggressive with the drag in the spring or the extra cultivation and try to do it early because at that point, um, and we've, we've come in late and we've had a field that the walkers got behind and it rained and, and we came in with size to cut the tops off because it's like, well, we're still cutting that, that head off, um, but it, it's late. So I don't know about your question. Um, I, I like mixing up tillage. I don't like to do the same depth. Uh, every, every year I'm trying to do a different depth, a different size of tillage. Uh, but I'll let you guys talk about that. You're actually uh, asking an important question, and it's got more application than just when do you go in and mow and feel the soybeans in that situation. That's uh, if we're clipping a field, say, after small grains. There is a stage when it's, when it's young enough that we can cut the top off and just still have it produce seed because we're not cutting below the growing point and we're cutting while it's still young enough to recover. And that's, that's a really important little piece of knowledge just to carry and when you're evaluating a situation and deciding what to do with it. Uh, we had a situation like you're describing, actually it was on the neighbor's farm. Mary Hall still has pictures of that that we use in some of our talks and our neighbor keeps saying, I wish we'd get rid of that picture. <laughs> But he had a, it, was, it was a field that had heavy manure for years, and it had box head, or it had uh, lamb's quarter, pigweed, and velvet leaves that stood about three feet taller than the crop. And we constructed a machine with 12 lawnmower blades that were the kind that suck up, and put it on the front of the tractor. And it did a beautiful job. We waited until the right stage, and he ended up with nice clean beans out of that, believe it or not. Just a comment on my neighbor said, well, what does it do to your beans? Actually, it was a more with blades on those. And the, the wind, it was like the beans were more flexible and they were being pushed down. And it was just cutting the weeds off. And I wish it looked that beautiful when I harvested it, but it still helped. <laughs>
That's what you'll find. I don't know if I mentioned that with these weed pullers or, or the electrocution unit. You know, you go through it, it'll do a nice job, but then you got to come back in five days because the next crop is starting to stick up above, and then you, you yeah. will usually go a third time because then there's more come up, and then it looks pretty good.